this course by reviewing a few experiments which led to the development of quantum mechanics. The first experiment we shall discuss is the photoelectric effect. Towards the end of the 19th century, it was known that if radiation of a sufficiently high frequency is incident on a metal surface, it can cause some electrons to be emitted from the metal surface. For most metals, the radiation is required to be in the ultraviolet range. But for alkali metals, the visible radiation suffices. So for example, for a metal surface like sodium or a calcium plate, if there is visible radiation incident on it, some electrons will be emitted. So let us have a look <coughs> at the experimental apparatus which is used to study the photoelectric effect. There is a metal plate over here which is enclosed in an evacuated glass chamber. The metal plate could be either sodium, calcium or some alkali metal and there is radiation, visible radiation incident on it. The visible radiation incident on this metal surface will cause electrons to be emitted by this surface. Now, the plate on which the radiation is incident is maintained at a positive potential by this circuit over here. And the positive potential applied over here can be varied by moving this contact along the rheostat over here. So we can apply a variable positive potential over here and this is the other plate is held at a constant negative potential. So there is a potential difference across these two plates and the potential difference is such that the electron which is emitted over from this surface over here is attracted back again towards the plate from which it is emitted. But there are certain electrons which will have sufficient energy to overcome the repulsion exerted by the plate over here. So even though the electrons are attracted towards this plate, the highly energetic electrons can overcome this attraction and make it to the plate over here. The electrons which make it to the plate over here now flow along this wire which gives rise to a current in this ammeter reading over here. So <clears throat> this is what is called the photo current. So the photo current measures the part of the electrons which are emitted from this plate which have sufficient energy to overcome this potential gradient V. <clears throat> now, what are the various features observed in this experiment? The first interesting feature which is observed is that there is no time delay between the, the incidence of the radiation and the start of the current. The moment you switch on the radiation, it is observed that the current starts immediately. This is the first interesting feature of the photoelectric effect experiment. The second interesting feature is that at a fixed frequency, the energy distribution of the electrons which are emitted does not depend on the intensity. Now, how does one come to this conclusion? So, in order to study this effect, let us consider a situation where there is light of a fixed frequency nu incident on the plate and we can vary the intensity of this radiation. So at a particular value of the intensity, let us call it I, when the potential across the two plates, so the potential we are going to refer to is this V over here and the larger is the potential, the more is the energy required for the electron to come to this end. The potential is always trying to prevent the electron from reaching this plate over here. It is opposing, trying to repel the electrons. So if for a larger value of the potential, the electron has to have a higher energy to reach this plate and give rise to a current. So when the potential is 0, a large number of electrons make it to the other plate which gives rise to a somewhat large, relatively large photo current. As the potential is increased, fewer and fewer electrons make it across to the 
negatively charged plate. So, the current keeps on decreasing and then for a value of the potential V c, the cri a critical value of the potential, no electrons make it to the cathode, the negatively charged plate, which allows us to reach a conclusion that there is no energy, no electron with sufficient energy to overcome the potential V c. So, the electron, the highest energy any electron which is emitted possesses is V c. Now, if we increase the intensity of the light, we observe that the current, the magnitude of the current increases, but as you increase the potential, the nature of the curve remains the same. It is just the same old curve which we had for at intensity i scaled up. So, if the radiation is scaled up by a factor of 2, the values also get scaled up correspondingly, but the highest energy that the electron possesses or the fraction of the electrons with any given value of the energy remains exactly same. So, the distribution of the energy of the electrons remains unchanged even if we increase the intensity of the radiation. It is just that there are more electrons emitted, but the fraction of the electrons with a certain value of energy remains unchanged. This is what these curves indicate. So, this is the second interesting feature of the photoelectric effect. The third interesting feature is what happens if we change the frequency of the incident radiation. So, it is found that if we change the frequency, so here we have shown the photo current for different values of frequency nu 1, nu 2 and nu 3, where nu 1 is the smallest frequency, nu 2 is larger than that and nu 3 is lar the largest frequency which is shown over here. As we increase the value of the frequency, the critical voltage where the current goes to 0 also increases. This is the fa first fact which you should note. What does this fact tell us? This fact tells us that as we increase the frequency of the incident radiation, the highest energy which the electron possesses also goes up. So, for a frequency nu 1, the electron with the highest energy has got energy V c 1. At the frequency nu 2, the electron with the highest energy has got energy V c 2, because here if I increase the potential more than this, there is no current and there is the current just goes to 0 at this value of the potential. Similarly, at the frequency nu 3, the electron with the highest energy has energy V c 3 and for different values of the frequency, the potential where the current goes to 0 increases. So, at the frequency nu 1, the potential where the current goes to 0 is V c 1 and at the frequency nu 2, the corresponding potential is V c 2. Nu 1 is less than nu 2, so V c 1 is less than V c 2. So, the ordering in the frequency is also reflected in the ordering of the potentials at which the current falls to 0. So, this is <coughs> one interesting feature. Another interesting feature is that there is a frequency nu naught below which there is no current at all. So, if I maintain the fixed intensity and change the frequency, there is a frequency nu naught below which however intense I make the radiation, there will be no current at all. So, <coughs> let us now look at another interesting feature. Suppose at a fixed, for a fixed material, let us say sodium or calcium or cesium, we look at the voltage where there is no current as a function of the frequency. So, this axis over here shows the frequency of the incident radiation. This axis over here shows the maximum energy possessed by the electrons that are emitted when this radiation falls on a metal surface. And this can be measured by just measuring the voltage where the current, the photocurrent goes to 0. 
So this shows the, photo, the value of the voltage where the photo current goes to 0. And multiplying this voltage by the charge of the electron, we can say that this is the energy of the electron with the highest, highest energy. So <clears throat> if we plot this as a function of frequency for different materials, and here we have shown the plot for cesium, sodium, and calcium, it turns out that this is a straight line for all of these materials. The slope of these different straight lines is the same independent of the material. And for each material, there is a separate characteristic frequency at which at frequencies less than this frequency, there is no photo current at all. So even for a zero volt voltage difference, there is no photo current. And this depends on the material which is being used. So for cesium, this frequency is smaller, whereas for sodium, the frequency is somewhat higher, and for calcium, the frequency is even higher. And for materials which are not alkali metals, the frequency is much higher in the ultraviolet range. <clears throat> now let us try to understand this phenomena in terms of the classical theory of radiation. Well, in the classical theory of radiation, the electromagnetic wave which is incident, the radiation which is incident is an electromagnetic wave whose evolution is governed by the Maxwell's equation. So the radiation which is coming, you can think of as being an electric field which is oscillating with some frequency nu. And there is a magnetic field V in the direction perpendicular to the electric field. So the radiation is incident on this metal plate over here. The radiation is incident in the direction which is normal to the surface of the metal plate. And the radiation is made up of an electric field which is oscillating at some frequency nu. There is a magnetic field perpendicular to the electric field oscillating with the same frequency. The incident <coughs> radiation also has a wavelength lambda. And corresponding to the wavelength lambda and the direction of propagation n, we have the wave vector which is 2 pi by lambda into the direction of propagation n. So there is a wave vector in the direction of propagation of the radiation. And the wave vector is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So these characterize the incident radiation. And <coughs> the energy of the electromagnetic radiation keeps on arriving continuously on the plate. So this is the <coughs> basic understanding which we have in the classical theory of electromagnetism that the metal plate is over here. The radiation keeps on arriving continuously on this metal plate. And we may think that we can explain all of these phenomena which we have just, I just mentioned to you, which is observed when radiation falls on a metal plate. And we, it is quite plausible that what is happening is that the electron gathers this radiation which is incident in the electromagnetic wave. And once the electron gathers sufficient energy to come out of the metal surface, it just gets knocked out. And this gives rise to the current. So it is plausible that the classical theory of electromagnetic radiation can explain the phenomena which I just outlined to you. But a detailed, <coughs> if one tries to make a detailed model for this phenomena, one lands up in trouble. So this is the interesting thing which gives rise to the need for quantum mechanics. So let me now go into it in a slightly more detailed manner. So it is observed that there is a photo current for radiations of the order of 10 to the power minus 4 watts per meter square. So even at such low values of the radiation intensity, one can have a measurable photo current. Now, <clears throat> thus, if we assume that this energy is incident on the whole surface, which is 1 meter square, so for a surface 1 meter square, we have 10 to the power minus 4 watts incident on it. Now, <clears throat> there are 10 to the power 19 electrons, atoms on this surface. So a surface of the metal, 1 meter square in area, 
has 10 to the power 19 atoms. So if we have 10 to the power minus 4 watts incident on 10 to the power 19 atoms, then and each atom, each electron in this atom, one electron in this atom will have, will require of the order of one electron volts for it to be emitted from the metal surface. So if the energy arrives continuously in the electromagnetic radiation and it is distributed over 10 to the power 19 atoms, then it will take one electron two weeks to gather enough energy to leave the metal surface. So based on this calculation, we, do, we should not see any photo current before even one electron has got sufficient energy to leave the metal surface. And to have a significant current, many electrons have to gather this much of energy. So it is quite a surprising fact that you see a photo current instantaneously after you switch on the radiation. According to these kind of estimates, it appears that one electron requires two weeks to gather enough energy to be emitted from the metal surface and for a discernible current it takes much longer time. So you would expect that once you switch on the radiation, the current should start flowing after quite some time of the order of weeks. But this is not observed. What is observed is that the current starts off immediately. So this is the first problem which is encountered. <coughs> the second feature <coughs> which is which the classical theory is unable to explain, which is what the graphs all seem to demonstrate. The, in the classical theory, the energy arrives continuously and the energy is independent of the frequency. It just depends on the in intensity of the radiation. And the energy gets distributed over all the electrons, over all the atoms, and the atoms continuously keep on absorbing these energy. And once the electron has sufficient energy, it just gets knocked out. Now, <coughs> this does not explain the frequency dependence of this phenomena. What is observed is that light of a low intensity, even at a high frequency, is able to cause a photocurrent, whereas light of a high <coughs> intensity but at a low frequency is not. Well, you would expect the light of a high intensity to carry more energy and we would expect that light of a high intensity would cause a larger photocurrent irrespective of the frequency. But what is observed is something quite different. We observe a definite frequency dependence. Once you are below the frequency, a, cri a critical frequency, nu naught, however large the intensity of the light may be, you are unable to cause any photocurrent. You are unable to knock out any electrons. So however large you make the intensity, somehow the energy is not getting transferred to the electrons at a low frequency. Whereas at a high frequency, even if you have a very low intensity radiation, you are able to generate a photocurrent. So at a high frequency, somehow the energy gets transmitted to the electrons and the electrons get sufficient energy to leave the metal surface. So this is something which is very surprising and which cannot be explained by the classical theory where the incident energy just depends on the intensity of the radiation and the energy arrives continuously. So it is not possible to explain how the frequency dependence comes about. <clears throat> so this was a major problem early in, the, early in the 20th century and late in the 19th century. And this was explained by Einstein. Einstein proposed that the electromagnetic radiation energy does not arrive continuously on the metal surface. He proposed that the energy in the electromagnetic radiation arrives on the metal surface <coughs> in packets or quanta and the or particles called photons. So he proposed, he made a drastic radical proposition which differs from the Maxwell's theory prediction, he proposed that the, that the energy, the electromagnetic energy arrives on the metal surface in the, forms, in the form of packets or quanta and these packets you could think of as particles called photons and each photon has energy which is proportional to the frequency. So each photon has energy E 
which is proportional to the frequency nu and the constant of frequency uh, constant of proportionality h is 6.624 6 point to 10 to the power minus 36 joule second so if you multiply this with frequency you will get something of unit energy and the constant over here h is the planck constant which was introduced earlier by planck in order to explain the black body radiation so einstein's <coughs> let me just show you pictorially what Einstein's proposition was and what the Maxwell's theory predicts. So Maxwell's theory of radiation of the electromagnetic wave predicts that the energy, that the electromagnetic radiation is a wave. The energy keeps on arriving here continuously and this we find cannot explain the frequency dependence of the photoelectric effect. Einstein made a drastic alteration of the whole picture he suggested that the electron, the, that, that the photon is what is the electromagnetic radiation. He suggested that the energy does not arrive continuously. It arrives in discrete packets called photons. These are particles called photons. And the energy of each photon is some constant of proportionality, the Planck constant, into the frequency of the radiation. With this, <coughs> kind of a picture, it is possible to explain the photoelectric effect. So let us look at what the photoelectric effect is all about. So we have the metal surface and we have vacuum and electron inside the metal. So this is the surface between these two. On the left hand side, we have the metal. On the right hand side, we have vacuum. <clears throat> An electron inside the metal is at a lower energy. The, an electron when it comes out, it must have either zero energy or a positive kinetic energy. Whereas inside the metal, the electron is in a potential well and it has got a lower energy. And the difference between these two, that is an electron which is in vacuum and an electron in the metal is some constant W, some energy difference W. So this is the depth of the potential well. And the electron has to be given this much energy for it to be able to come out. Now, <clears throat> the incident radiation which comes over here comes and hits the electron. And the incident radiation carries energy H nu. If the incident, so the incident radiation you should think of as particles with energy H nu. And the energy which, the minimum energy which is required to knock the electron out which is the depth of the potential well inside the metal surface is what is called the work function. And for sodium, the work function is 2.3 electron volts. So you have to give this much energy to bring one electron out from the metal to the vacuum. Now in Einstein's picture, the radiation arrives over here in the form of particles each of energy H nu. Now if the energy of each photon is more than the work function, over here, so it, so each, if each photon has energy more than this depth of the potential well inside the metal surface, then the photons can knock the electron out. And the difference in the energy, so the photon comes with the energy H nu. It, let us say, it passes on all its energy to the electron inside the metal. So once, so it has to now, <clears throat> so the, to bring the electron out, it has to do a work and this energy is lost. So H nu minus W is the kinetic energy of the electron after it comes out. And this is, if H nu is less than, if the frequency of the photon is less than some value so that the energy of the incident photon is not, is less than W, if the photon doesn't have sufficient energy to knock the electron out and we have no photocurrent, once the incident radiation, the frequency of the incident radiation crosses a threshold value so that the energy is greater than the value W. The radiation can knock out some electrons and higher the frequency, the larger will be the kinetic energy of the electrons which are knocked out and the larger will be the potential which is required to produce a zero current. So we see <coughs> that the Einstein's postulate that the electron energy 
is actually incident in the form of particles called photons, each of which have energy h nu proportional to the frequency, explains everything that we see about the photoelectric effect. So in the Einstein's picture, if you, incident, if you increase the intensity of the incident radiation, you do not increase the energy of individual photons. What you do is you just increase the number of photons. So if the energy of incident photon is less than the work function, even if you in increase the intensity, there is no way you can cause an electron to be emitted. It is only when the energy of the incident photon crosses the work function, which is a characteristic value for each material, it is only then that you are able to knock out electrons. Once you are able to knock out electrons, if you increase the incident of the in incident radiation, then if you increase the intensity, then you increase the number of photons, which gives rise to more electrons being knocked out, so you have a larger current. So this we see explains the photoelectric effect. <clears throat> but it also introduces something drastically new. We know that in the classical theory of electromagnetic radiation that light is an vaso wave. And the wave nature of light is essential if you want to explain phenomena like interference, diffraction, all of which are observed and you ought to explain these phenomena, you require light to be a wave. But Einstein also shows that if you want to explain the photoelectric effect, you have to attribute a particle-like property to light. So this leads us to a situation where we see that light has a radiation, has a dual nature. It behaves both as a particle as well as a wave. If you want to explain phenomena, like interference or diffraction, you have to invoke the wave property of light. Whereas if you want to explain phenomena like the photoelectric effect, you have to invoke the particle property of light. So whether the question is light or is radiation a wave or is it a particle depends on the phenomena which you want to explain. <clears throat> Let us quickly go over to a different experiment which again exhibits the dual nature of light. The <clears throat> second experiment which we shall discuss is the Compton effect. So <clears throat> the Compton effect is observed using X-ray radiation. So let me just briefly tell you first what is X-ray. X-ray is electromagnetic radiation with wavelength in the range 0.1 to 100 Armstrong. So X-ray is known to be electromagnetic radiation and there is definite evidence that this is a wave with wavelength in the range 0.1 to 100 Armstrongs. Now let us consider a situation where there is X-ray incident on an electron. So what happens when this wave is incident on an electron is that the oscillating electric field in the wave will cause the electron also to oscillate. As a consequence of the oscillation of the electron, the electron will again emit radiation in different directions. And this is what is referred to as the scattered radiation from the electron. So this is what is called scattering. We have X-ray incident in one direction. The X-ray incident in this one direction over here is, after it is incident on the electron, is seen to be emitted in different directions. And this is what is scattering. And the phenomena of scattering occurs as follows. The incident X-ray causes the electron to oscillate. An oscillating charged particle emits radiation. And it is this radiation emitted by the electron which we see in different directions which is referred to as the scattered X-ray. <clears throat> now in the classical theory of radiation, the wavelength, the, the wavelength and the frequency of the incident X-ray emission also determine the frequency of oscillation of the electron. So, 
So the, so the frequency of this incident radiation will determine the frequency of oscillation of the electron and the electron will oscillate at the same frequency as the incident radiation. And the <coughs> frequency of the emitted radiation, the radiation emitted by the electron because of this oscillation will also be at the same frequency. So what will be observed classically is that the scattered radiation will be at the same frequency as the incident radiation. <clears throat> so this is what is expected from the classical theory that the scattered radiation should have the same wavelength and frequency as the incident radiation. So this is what is expected classically. Now <clears throat> let us see what happens when you actually do the experiment. When you actually do the experiment, it is observed that the, there is a small component of the radiation which is observed at a different wavelength and the shift in the wavelength is dependent on the angle. It also depends on the constant h which we had introduced earlier, the Planck constant. It depends on the mass of the electron and it depends on c, the speed of light. So <clears throat> what is observed is that the radiation emitted in different directions in addition to a component which is at the same frequency also has a component which is at a different or same wavelength also has a component which is at a different wavelength and the difference in wavelength from the incident wavelength is a function of the angle phi and the difference in wavelength is given by this. It depends on 1 minus cos phi where phi is the scattering angle, the, it is the angle with the incident direction of the radiation and it involves these three numbers, the Planck constant, the mass of the electron and the speed of light. And it is this shift in the wavelength which is known as the Compton effect. <clears throat> now let us see how one can explain this Compton effect. So there is no way you can explain the Compton effect in the classical theory because in the classical theory the electron oscillates in exactly the same frequency as the incident radiation and the emitted radiation will also be at the same frequency. So how does one go about explaining the Compton effect? So the explanation of the Compton effect is as follows. It is exactly analogous to the way the photoelectric effect was explained. To explain the Compton effect, you have to assume that the incident radiation arrives in the form of particles or photons which are particles of radiation and the energy of the photon depends on the frequency E is equal to H nu. So there is an incident photon which is denoted by the gamma over here. The photon comes over here, there is a particle whose energy E1 is H nu where nu is the frequency of the incident x-ray. So the photon, the radiation, incident radiation should be thought of as a photon, as a particle with energy E1 is equal to H nu, which we can also write as H cross into omega, where H cross is the constant H which we had introduced earlier divided by 2 pi. So H cross is the Planck constant divided by 2 pi. So the incident energy can also be written as h cross into omega, where omega is nothing but 2 pi times the frequency or the angular frequency. So the incident x-ray radiation is actually a particle, a photon with energy h cross omega. In addition, we also have to attribute a momentum to the incident photon and we attribute a momentum p which is equal to h cross into k. So the incident radiation is a particle of energy E1 and momentum P1 where the momentum is h cross into the wave vector k. The wave vector k is nothing but 2 pi divided by lambda. So it is inversely proportional to lambda into the direct incident direction of propagation which is the direction in which the wave is, the, the radiation is incident. So in order to explain the Compton effect, we have to assume, we have to postulate that the incident x-ray arrives in the form of a photon with energy E1 and momentum P1, 
where the energy is h cross omega, the momentum is h cross into the wave vector k. So we have this particle, in, it comes and hits the electron over here. This is nothing but the usual standard two body scattering collision and it is an <clears throat> elastic collision. So the total energy of the two particles after they get scattered of each other is equal to the energy of the two particles before the scattering. So the kinetic energy of the electron was zero and all the energy was in the photon to start with. After the photon collides with the electron, it gets scattered into in some direction over here in some angle phi and the electron gets scattered in some other direction. So we can now apply the conservation of energy that is the energy of the electron after the collision plus the energy of the photon after the collision has to be equal to the original energy of the photon which tells us that the energy of the photon after the collision has to be less than the energy of the photon before the collision which implies that the frequency omega prime of the scattered photon is less than the frequency of the incident photon or we can say that the wavelength has gone up. So we can calculate, we can use the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum because the momentum also has changed and the particle over here will have a different momentum and the electron which gets scattered in this direction will have some non-zero momentum. So we can apply the conservation of energy and conservation of momentum which will give us relations between the incident frequency the scattered frequency and the direction and we can if we solve this it turns out that we can explain this observed phenomena that the wavelength of the light actually changes after the scattering and the change depends on the angle at which the light gets scattered. So we can explain this whole phenomena by just using conservation of energy and momentum. The new thing which has to go in is that the X-ray actually arrives in the form of particles and it gets scattered off and the scattered X-ray is also a particle whose energy and momentum we know and whose energy and momentum are given by this. So here again we have to invoke the fact that the X-ray is actually incident on the electron in the form of particles. <coughs> so this we see both of these experiments we see finally give us to a picture where we have to describe the incident radiation in terms of two different things depending on the phenomena we want to study. For phenomena like interference or diffraction, we have to treat the incident electromagnetic radiation as an electromagnetic wave which can be written in this fashion E as a function of R and T which has some amplitude into the phase factor over here and the phase factor can be written as e to the power i k dot r minus omega t. So the wave is characterized by two quantities, the angular frequency omega and the wave vector k. k gives us the direction in which the wave propagates and omega gives us the time dependence. So this gives us the spatial dependence of the wave, this gives us the time dependence of the wave and the radiation is described by a wave like this. And this has to be invoked if you want to explain interference or diffraction or such phenomena which are all observed. There is another class of phenomena which if you want to explain these then you have to treat the radiation as a particle and the energy of the particle or the photon which is the particle which carries the electromagnetic energy, the energy of the photon is again related to the same angular frequency omega which appears when you want to express it as a wave and the energy is h cross into omega. Similarly, the momentum of the photon is also related to the wave vector which appears when you want to describe the electromagnetic radiation as a wave and the momentum is given as h cross into the wave vector k. So we see that <coughs> these experiments, the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect lead us to attribute two totally different properties to
to the same thing which is radiation. Radiation behaves as both, light behaves as both a, an electromagnetic wave and it also behaves as a particle, a photon. And the energy and, and momentum of the particle are related to the wave vector and the angular frequency of the wave, which you have to invoke to, to describe certain phenomena of the radiation. So <clears throat> this leads us to a very confusing situation. We cannot say for sure whether light, whether, electro, whether the radiation or light is a wave or whether it is a particle. And we are left with a situation where we have to attribute both of these properties. We have to, we have to take a point of view where light has both of these properties. It is both a wave as well as a particle and we have to invoke each of these properties, one of these properties or each of these properties to, to explain different phenomena. So for certain phenomena, you have to invoke the wave property of light. For another class of phenomena, you have to invoke the particle property of light. And the basic problem is how does one unite these two properties of light? How does one have a physical theory which incorporates both the wave nature of the light as well as the particle nature of the light. And this is what leads us to the theory for, of quantum mechanics. So I shall go into it in more detail in the next lecture, continuing on the same theme.